Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Reference Point. I'm your host, Dave Cokerhook. This evening, I am very happy to have with me the Executive Director of Emergency USA, Mr. Eric Taubert, who is going to talk to us today about um, something that I think you really need to pay attention to. His organization is, is doing some incredible things uh, that tie into helping people who are the victims of armed conflict, the civilian victims of armed conflict. So, Eric, Thank you for coming all the way down from San Francisco to be here on Reference Point today. Really appreciate you coming on in. Oh, thanks, Dave. Thanks for having me. So let's just start out a little bit just by telling us, help our viewing audience understand what is Emergency U, uh, USA, how did this organization, organization get started, and, and that kind of a thing. Sure. Uh, so Emergency USA is a San Francisco-based office of the international humanitarian organization called Emergency, which was founded in Milan in 1994. So we're celebrating our 20th anniversary this year. Oh, congratulations. Thank you, thank you. And um, the Emergency USA came about uh, when a, the co-founder of Emergency, who's a war surgeon, his name is Gino Strada, came to the US on a book tour. He's written a couple of books. One's been translated into English. Um, and he came and talked about his personal experience in a very intimate way through a book called Green Parrots. Which I happen to have a copy of here that you were kind enough to share with me. We'll talk about that a little bit later. You're welcome. Um, and so that's people uh, were interested in, in, in finding out how more they can support this type of work. And, and also, you know, once you, a big part of what Gina would talk about is helping uh, raise awareness around what our fellow civilians are facing in these areas of conflict, as you mentioned. Well, I'm going to interject right there because you used the term war surgeon. Yeah. Okay. So can you kind of, wh what does that mean, actually? We're talking about a war surgeon. What can, can Go into that a little bit more. Yeah. Uh, so Gino, um, there's several uh, medical staff that work for us, but Gino himself uh, studied nearby here at Stanford as a young surgeon, and he specialized in, in cardiac and lung transplant. But... Uh, early on in his career, after he'd done that, he spent some time working for the International Committee for the Red Cross oh, okay. as a surgeon, oh, surgeon, surgeon. Okay. in war zones. Uh, so, you know, he was one of those signed up for six months, stayed for eight years. <laughs> and uh, after that, you know, he, he founded Emergency, he and his wife and some close friends at their kitchen table in Milan in 1994 in response to the genocide in Rwanda. Um. And so the need was for people who had specialized medical experience in areas of conflict people who have seen landmines, who's seen and dealt with children uh, with sniper bullets and all these really gruesome things that we do to each other but can handle that, know how to treat that and be able to help provide those people with extended lives. So, so Gino has become uh, a war surgeon and at our hospital in Afghanistan there's actually a training program for people who want to specialize in that type of medicine. But, but this, the, the, the work that Emergency is doing is focused in the direction of helping the civilian population that are affected by these armed conflicts and not the, um, the military personnel who are involved in those things. Is that correct? That's right. And it's one of the things that Gino talked about and as emergency we often talk about and something I didn't know until I heard Gino speak was that in contemporary conflicts up to 90% of the victims are civilians. And these are people just like you and I just trying to get by day to day. And even up to a third of those are children. These are kids under the age of 14. These are very young people. Wow. Who, are, who now suffer the brunt of these conflicts. You, and you don't think about that. You think about, yeah. when we think about the stuff that we studied in history, like uh, Gettysburg, okay, you, right. had, you had these two armies uh, attacking each other and, and thousands of people perished. And then um, Waterloo with uh, Napoleon and you know, you know, the French and the British, all these sorts of things. You yeah. see, Iwo Jima, okay, the armies right. are fighting each other. That's what you see in the movies, yeah. and that's what you, you read in, in the history books and all that sort of thing. But that's not what's going on. I mean, I'm guessing that that the civilian population has virtually always suffered when it comes to armed conflict. But is it more pronounced now than it may have been 50, 80 years ago? That's right. And so, for example, World War I, that statistic is around 10%, this different style of fighting you talked about. And it has slowly escalated, obviously, through World War II. There's a huge jump. Um, and so there's kind of two things that are on the surface level that are impacting this. One... Uh, militaries are, have learned to better protect their personnel. Mm -hmm. um, but two, the other oppor opportunity there is that civilians often end up accidentally on the other side of these type of, you know, these large bombings from along long way or these landmines that are left for generations oh, to just yeah. be discovered later by children. Right. The landmines are a big thing. Well, I want to, no. you mentioned the, the, the book Green Parrots and, and one, <laughs> 
reading this book, it was amazing to me. There are certain a number, there are a number of, of um, uh, sections in the book or chapters where he talks about the effects of um, these um, devices. Some of them are mines that are actually buried in the ground, but there's also certain explosive devices that are just sort of sprinkled around the countryside that people might stumble upon or pick up or whatever, and oftentimes it's kids that do that. So, so, t tell us what the green parrot actually means. Yeah, so do you know the name this book, green parrots? It's, uh, it's, that's the Afghan name. That's kind of the local slang for a certain type of landmine that was deployed by the Russians. So we're going back a couple of conflicts in the same area of Afghanistan. Um, but it's, it's the reason why they're called the green parrot is they're a very small, bright green, winged, anti-personnel mine. And these were distributed by helicopters as in all different sorts of ways through Afghanistan. And they're still being discovered accidentally by children who are collecting firewood or working with their family to uh, farm or, you know, all the different tasks that they do are just traveling from one area to another. And they're accidentally picking them up. And this device is, is really intense in the sense that it's not meant to explode on contact. Yeah. Right? We kind of think of those Hollywood landmines. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Drive yeah, over on it, boom, tank. he's gone. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But these, these um, green parrots um, are designed to be picked up and manipulated and for a certain amount of pressure before they explode. And once they do explode, they have just enough explosive to wound into maim. And uh. so what's happening is that there's now a generation, like the, the young boy that pictured on the cover of the book, who's severely injured, most likely lost an arm, or may even be blinded by these green parrots. And so they become a social economic burden on their family and on their community. So it's this really intense, multi-generational. The, 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 there's, again, going back to the book, he talks about a number of circumstances, situations, the, the, um, uh, the Iraq-Iran conflict and a number of other things and the Kurdish stuff. And, but there's a lot of circumstances where they talk about deploying landmines. Yeah. And I'm wondering, do, do we have any sense as to whether or not that deployment is intended to inflict harm on the civilian population as a demoralizing effect? Or is it really intended as a military effort to prevent an army from coming across the, the, the border type thing. Yeah, I think it comes down to who you ask uh -huh. uh, <laughs> or who's willing to confess to what. Uh, obviously, there, there's a lot of language around them being strategic and important military devices, um, but that's just not what we, we see as emergency, and in our, especially in our hospitals in Afghanistan. We, we see the other side of that. We see these children 10, 20 years later, or even uh, the, the farmers and these adults who know better but just accidentally find themselves at that one time in the wrong area. Um, and so there's, there's that issue with these types of devices, and it's why it's such a huge issue that we continue to see in our hospitals in Afghanistan. Let's talk about the hospitals in Afghanistan. Afghanistan, was that the first location where in emergency deployed personnel or? or? No. Uh, so that was the first structure that emergency built. The first structure that emergency built. So yeah. they had deployed personnel into other locations, but you yeah. actually built the first emergency hospital in Afghanistan. Right. Okay. That's right. So Gino, after that meeting at that kitchen table, Gino uh, and some colleagues went to Rwanda, to Kigali in 94 oh, okay. as an independent um, entity. And they reopened the surgical center in the main hospital and then we also helped open the maternity ward of that hospital. So that was kind of the first exploration for emergency. Uh, and then the first clinic was built in Iraq in 96 in a city called Diane. Mm -hmm. But this was in Anaba in Afghanistan. This is going back to 1999. Okay. Previous conflict. All right. Uh, in the Panjshir Valley, emergency built their first full-on surgical center. Got it. I think we have a um, uh, an image of that. Um, yeah. So this image here is the second hospital. This is the surgical center in Kabul. Oh, okay. Yeah. And so this, so the surgical center in Anaba opened uh, in early 2000, full-on, and then Gino and the team there immediately went to Kabul because it was the the other side of the conflict, if you will. In Kabul, okay. so that's why they built the second center for the civilians on that side. Okay, so um, the the conflict that we're talking about when they did this in in would say 1998 started in 1999, 1999, and then the hospital in Kabul opened in March of 2001. And who, the fighting was between who and who? That was between at the time uh, the Taliban uh -huh. in Kabul and the the Nor Northern Alliance. The Northern Alliance. Okay, yep. and so the first actual facility was built in a a location that was controlled by the Northern Alliance. Is that 
Pretty right. much, it was pretty, and and that location was selected because it's also was the front lines. Was the front lines, if you will. It's where the okay. most of the civilians were being injured. But technically, according to those maps at those times, that was on their side. On their side, and yep. so they, <laughs> in other words, these Gino and his people put themselves in harm's way to to, to work for and to service the civilian population that was right. Be, be, <laughs> Right there at, at the spearhead of that conflict is what you're telling That's me. That's right, yep. Okay. I mean, it's amazing to even think uh, of what that means. It's a, it's a terrifying concept. Yeah. Um, but then they, so they built the one facility, and then they built another facility in the capital of the country, which is Kabul, yep. right? Yep. And, and that's what we have the image for, is the one in Kabul. Correct. Okay, and when did that go into, start, start being constructed? So that, st that construction started in 2000, but it opened full on uh, in March of 2001. Okay. And when we talk about it as a facility, what all is it capable? What, what is what yeah. does it have? It's a surgical center with uh, three operating rooms, again, specialized in, in war medicine, dealing mostly with bullets and landmines and these okay. types of severe injuries. Um, and it has about a 100 bed ward. Um, so there's an emergency room, the operating room, and then the bed for, for rehabilitation and ongoing treatment to be able to make sure that once these folks do leave or these kids leave back to their schools and their homes, that they're, they're well taken care of there's and they're back on their feet. And I think we have uh, the, the image of the operating, one of the operating theaters. And you said there's no. like three operating rooms in the facility? That's right? correct. And Did, Is the other location in the other city uh, in Afghanistan still operational as well? It is. And when that also in 2003, you were able to add a maternity center due to the needs of the valley at that time. It's ah. the only maternity center in a very vast okay. area. So who are the personnel? Where do, they, where yeah. do you find people <laughs> that are willing to go do this? Yeah, well, not everybody is, uh, has the, the, the wherewithal, or whatever that Gino has to start this, but <laughs> we do have quite a bit of outreach here in the U.S. as part of our role as Emergency USA, is providing recruitment and opportunities for people here who want to go and work. And the work there is having an opportunity to go for six months. It's a paid position. There's no volunteers. Mm -hmm. And your part of your responsibility is providing training. Because in addition to the health care, it's also important to us to provide education and jobs. So the international oh. staff makes up a small portion of the uh, overall staff, about 20%. So we hire mostly Afghans in Afghanistan, or locals, wherever we are. Because uh -huh. the goal ultimately is to turn these hospitals over to the communities. So you're educating the people there yeah. in the administration of something like this, the maintenance of a facility like this, how to take care of the equipment, and then is there also medical training? Yep, technical expertise, nurses, surgeons, physicians, um, everything that's, that's needed to run the hospital and, and keep it going. Got it. And have either of the two facilities in Afghanistan been turned over to the local population at this point? Not yet. Uh, uh, you know, we talked about the, the hospital in Kabul opening in March of 2001. Um, and then of course, another conflict started in October of 2001 uh, and, and still going on to this day. Right. Uh, so that's been a major barrier for us to be able to provide enough education and training to be able to turn these hospitals over. Once this war ends, when it does, like all wars end, mm -hmm. we'll, that will be the beginning of that process. Got it, okay. And I think we had one other image from the Kabul, or from the Afghanistan, which is actually uh, the image of a, one of the children that had been served there. If I, is that correct? That's correct. Uh, so the operating rooms there are what we would expect and want to take our friends and family to here in the West. That's why that, that picture reminds me of the high standard surgery that's being provided and care that's there. Because young people like this come in. This is um, a young boy named Murtaza. He's only seven years old at the time, and he was out in the rural area of Kabul where he lives with his families for generations, and he accidentally stumbled upon an anti-personnel mine, not knowing what it was or just being a curious boy, right, it happens. Yeah, yeah. Uh, unfortunately, it exploded, and it, and it took his right arm and injured him quite severely, but luckily uh, the folks nearby knew enough to bring him to the emergency hospital, but they knew he'd be treated for free with high standard. Now, now Murtaz is back home, back at school, being a, a young boy again. So how well known in Afghanistan, just in general throughout the country, are the two facilities that you're operating? How well known are they amongst the population? Yeah. These two are, are, are quite well known because of they're a couple hours apart by drive, depending the dirt roads and how they are. Um, and they've been there for so long. Mm -hmm. In addition to these two surgical centers, uh, Emergency in 2004 also opened a surgical center in Lashkarga, which is in the south in the Himalayan province. Mm -hmm. And to support those surgical centers, Emergency, in addition to the maternity center, has also opened and runs 
30 first aid posts. And these are clinics, if you will, mm -hmm. out in the rural areas to be able to pro provide transportation to those who need it or just triage if there's a landmine burn or whatever, they can treat it right away. So given that capacity when emergency is done there and how long we've been there, emergencies treated over 10% of the population. Wow. So we're talking over 3 million people in Afghanistan during these past 13 years. Wow, so. incredible. And at the moment, how many emergency uh, employees and how many local yeah. uh, Afghani uh, personnel do you have? Uh, right now, give or take, is about 1,500 Afghans employed through the organization and probably, I would guess, around 25 kind of goes up and down international staff. Only 25 in international staff? And they're, they're, wow. Yeah, they're all really amazing people, as you can imagine. I guess. <laughs> So. And, and one of the things that's fascinating to me is the, the level of care that you were talking about. And I, I yeah. learned, you know, reading in the book, and you were just talking about it and showing, you know, when we take a look at the, um, the images that we took a look at at the facility, it's not, you have these impressions of medicine in a third world country, of the type of thing like, oh my gosh, you know, if you ever have to go there, you better watch out because, you, you know, you may never come out. Right. But you're talking about a very high standard of uh, care and a very, and, and um, I guess you'd call uh, uh, modern facilities, modern equipment, mm -hmm. and all that sort of thing. Is that correct? That's right. And this is part of our human rights issue. And this is something that why emergency was founded and the, there's a need for the work that we do is we're often the only surgical center in this area with a specialty on war medicine mm. and the only, sometimes the only hospital that has this modern type of equipment. I don't know if it's still true, but at one point, the emergency hospital in Kabul had the only free CT machine in the country. Oh, wow. So you're talking about some major head injuries. How are they even going to be diagnosed, let alone treated? But that's the point of, like, as a human rights organization, that's really important to us, that we're providing the type of education and care that's capable within the world, mm -hmm. not just that developing country, because that's often what can be the challenge in these areas, and this right. kind of sets us apart. And this is part of Gino's vision and what he saw. Have you had the opportunity to turn over any facilities to local populations anywhere in the, in the world yet? Yeah, mostly, interesting enough, in northern Iraq and Kurdistan. Oh. Uh, part of the surgical centers and clinics there have been part of their national health care system now, as well as in Cambodia, a very large Cambodia. long time landmine issue in yes. Cambodia, as we're all aware of. Um, emergency has a surgical center in Batambang with some supporting clinics nearby, and those have been turned over as well. So. Are those. Um, clinics that have been turned over to the local uh, population, are they maintaining them in terms of the free service clinics and stuff like that? Yeah, that's, that's part of the agreement from the beginning and then definitely during transition and afterward, that they're all high standard. They maintain that high standard and free of charge mm -hmm. as a basic, you know, health care as a human right initiative. And so they maintain that going forward. And technology and, 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 and I guess you'd call it, um, what's the term, uh, in terms of medicine and medical procedures and things like that are constantly evolving and yeah. so there are things that we're able to do today that we couldn't do five years ago right okay and so does the emergency team stay in communication with the, uh, the facilities that they've um, turned over and, and kind of provide current day information and stuff like that uh, they, pr they, they they are there for humanitarian assistance and support but that role typically falls on the partner uh, often the local medical university and the ministries of health and their areas so that you're able to keep the locals informed through their own resources. So they're not codependent on us as an organization in any way, but can really thrive in the medical field with what they have and move it forward. Makes sense. Makes sense. Now, one of the other locations in the world that you had told me that the um, emergency has uh, provided some assistance is in Sierra Leone, right? All right. So tell me about Sierra Leone. What was the situation in Sierra Leone? Well, Sierra Leone, um, as a lot of us know, uh, had a very intense civil war for over a decade that started in the early 90s. Emergency built a surgical center there, again, on a very heavy area near Freetown, which is the capital. Our surgical center is based in Godrich, which is just south of there. And that opened in late 2000. Luckily, the civil war ended shortly after that. Mm -hmm. And once we were able to stabilize the, the surgical center there, the need at that time, the local need, again, working with local partners and figuring out what the greatest need is that we can provide within our capacity, uh, came up with pediatrics. Oh. So we were able to expand and open a pediatric center in that same hospital. Interesting. 
Fascinating. And I think we have an image from Sierra Leone right now. Is that right? That's right. Yeah. So these are some uh, three young kids there healing, playing, having fun. Uh, <laughs> and this is Dr. Paulo, who we see here. He's one of our orthopedic surgeons. Yeah. Uh, really amazing, talented surgeon and a really incredible um, person. And so these are the type of international staff that we're looking for. People having a lot of experience here. And you know, when I was in Sierra Leone and talking with Dr. Paulo, a lot of what he talked about of why he left the comforts and privileges of his life to come to Sierra Leone and, and work is the training aspect. He really loved and was really inspired by look, working with the local Sierra Leonean surgeons oh. and nurses and, and, and physicians. helping them and, and, and teaching them. Yeah. Oh, fascinating. Uh, it really motivated him. And then, of course, the time with these kids is yeah. unforgettable. Precious, so. I'm sure. Well, it's got to be a mixed, a very emotional situation. You're dealing. You look at some of the photos and you read some of the stories that were in the book. I mean, the young people, they've gone through this incredible trauma and yet they bounce back. They're, yeah, the, the people in this area, I've been fortunate enough to meet and you hear through Gino's book and through the stories from um, all of our international staff there as well as our local staff. What I often always remember and come away from is feeling really inspired and just really incredibly full of hope by because of these kids and because of these families, despite these huge challenges they face, right. is have an incredible grounding in life and are just really present and really hopeful for the future. And that's, you know, we're trying to do our little part so that that way when they do have a, a major injury, they don't end up, you know, dead just because they broke their arm. Right. They can come, get the surgery, go back to school and continue right. to, to inspire others and to pursue their own human potential. Now you, you touched on something that um, uh, uh, you said you're my, our own little part, and I think that's something I want to ask a little bit about because there are a lot of uh, international humanitarian organizations in the medical world. Some of them are doing inoculations, some of them are doing uh, like you know um, things for populations that are not in war zones yep. and malaria <laughs> um, um, issues and things like that. So how d d do these do you guys play well together, <laughs> I guess, is the question. You know, we like to think so for the most part. Um, you know, there's, there's no shortage of need. And the people who are there and the organizations that are there are there for the same reasons, which is to provide support to our fellow human beings. And in our case, to provide health. Mm -hmm. uh, there's this really fundamental level. And so every area looks a little different. Every group, every person will have their own experience there. But for the most part, collaboration and working together when we can and how we can to be able to treat more people mm -hmm. is always the goal. Cool. I'm going to take a moment to let the folks who are watching know that we're going to do a second segment of discussion here uh, with Eric because we've got a lot more material to cover, so there'll be another Reference Point show on that. But I also want to let them know that if they have any questions uh, for you about what you do or emergency or whatever, there's a couple of ways to get that information. You can send a, a query to me at info at referencepointtv.com or you can go up to the emergency website, correct? That's right. All of our information is on our website, which is www.emergencyusa.org. So folks who want to learn more, support, maybe even apply if they've got the, yeah. the time the and the interest, skills yeah. and the interest to go abroad, and we take care of all of that through our website. Cool. And it's, you've got some information up there, too. There's a video that's up there on, that, that's linked to the website that we're not able to show here tonight for no. a variety of reasons. but. But there is a very informative uh, video. It's only about five minutes long, but it's quite quite powerful. Oh, thank you. Yeah, if people go to the website and they visit our program section, they can see this video. It's a short, as you mentioned, Dave, a five-minute video that encapsulates 20 years, and if you can, in five, five minutes, minutes, right, right? <laughs> <laughs> of uh, the history. of, And you get to see more hospitals and see more patients and see more of our na of our staff, international, national staff. And that, to me, is really the powerful message. I can, you know, we can sit here and talk for days about this, but the folks and people can get on the website, the information is really, really powerful and inspiring. Right. Let's talk for a second while we have just a couple of minutes left in this segment. Let's talk for a little bit about the kind of people that are uh, brought together and that are deployed because it's, uh, obviously it's the surgical staff. Yep. And you mentioned nurses. That's right. right. But are there other uh, non uh, medical delivery personnel that need to participate in this, that, that you're looking to be part of the thing. If you're going to build a hospital, <laughs> you've got logistics, you've got construction, you've got purchasing, you've got all sorts of stuff. Right. 
Yeah, so for from the Emergency USA side, we are primarily focused on medical staff. And that's been their most successful partnership, surgeons, physicians, nurses, perfusionists, all the different folks that it takes to run the hospital from the medical side. Uh, we do have some international um, engineers, and obviously we're closely with an architecture firm as we're building these things and local physicians. But we also work really hard to source as much um, human power and potential locally. Mm. So we're careful to work with and mindful of working with local staff, local resources, and hiring as many people as possible there during the construction and the ongoing maintenance fee. Got it. So cool. for, for example, our hospital in Kabul, we have a, a hiring preference for people who have been injured by a landmine. Got it. How long have you been affiliated, Eric? I've been involved in some capacity going on 10 years now. 10 years, yeah. wow, incredible. So half Half of the life of the organization. That's right, just about. <laughs> it's about halfway there. Yeah. Very cool. We have about two minutes left in this segment of the show, and then we're going to come do another segment to talk a little bit more about some of the work that you do, the specific work that you do, and also want to get into a fascinating topic that I really want the folks to pay attention to in the next segment, which has to do with the work you guys are doing in the Sudan, which when I heard about that was just like, you got to be kidding me. I mean, right. it's, it's absolutely, it's very exciting. Yeah. It's scary, but yes. it's very, very exciting. <laughs> so uh, we'll, we'll do that when we come back. So um, I guess the, the wrap-up here is that you guys, your, your teams are putting themselves in harm's way for the sake of the folks who are what, what the politicians like to call collateral damage of, uh -huh. um, uh, of armed conflict. And it's not like we're getting any fewer armed conflicts, it doesn't look like. Right. So, so anyway... Um, Glad you're here. We're going to have another segment to talk about more of this information here when we come back. So, ladies and gentlemen, don't forget to tune us back in uh, next time on Reference Point, where we'll be taking up some more conversation on uh, emergency with Eric here. So, thank you for paying attention. Don't forget to go up to their website and check it out, and we'll see you next time on Reference Point.